Ladies and gentlemen, your keynote speaker, Hadi Partobi. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Hi, everybody. It's, it's great to be here. Uh, and uh, it's amazing to see all the folks in the audience who've been wearing Code.org hats and t-shirts. Uh, I saw many of you as I was walking in, uh, standing in line. Uh, for those of you who have made, heard me speak about this topic before, I apologize in advance if some of the things I say may be repetitive. I'm hoping at least half the audience hasn't heard my message uh, yet already. Uh, but I'm here to talk about the importance of computer science in America's schools and what all of you and all of us can do to help bring this field to more students in America's schools. Uh, I like to start all of my uh, talks with a story. This is a picture of me growing up as a child. And that's actually me with my twin brother, so this one is me on the left. Uh, so we actually, when, at this point, we were growing up in Tehran, Iran, uh, which is where I was born. And when I was around six years old, the country broke out into a war with the neighboring country of Iraq. And I spent most of my childhood Actually, our neighborhood was right next to the television station, which was a, actually a bombing target. So pretty much every evening of my childhood was spent in a basement holding our, our ears as our, as our neighborhood was getting bombed and hoping that it wouldn't hit our house, which is basically a really not good uh, sort of environment for a kid to grow up. Uh, but then things really changed one day when my dad brought home a computer, which is, that's what they looked like back then. And this was a Commodore 64, and he said, uh, and he said, this doesn't have any programs or games or apps on it, but here's a book on a programming language called BASIC, and you can teach yourself to make your own apps and games. Uh, and you know, curiously, just about 10 minutes ago or, or half an hour ago, I met a guy named Richard Wagner in the crowd who wrote one of the first books on uh, programming the Apple II, which was also the, the other computer around the time that we could have had. Uh, but like many, many others, I started learning how to code from a book, not from a school. And by the time I came to this country, you know, as a 12 or 13 year old, I was already quite good at programming. So when my best friends in school were getting jobs as, as you know, bus boys in restaurants or in gas stations, I managed to get jobs at tech companies and start off a career in tech. And now I'm basically living the American dream as an immigrant. Ed. And I, thank you. And you know, the American dream has changed quite a bit. You know, it's no longer about going out west and building a log cabin or panning for gold or any of those types of things. Uh, the American dream these days is intertwined very tightly with the idea of changing the world through technology. There's, you know, if you look at the, the leaders of technology in this country or in any country, but, but especially in America, they represent the American dream that anybody could grow up to become a Mark Zuckerberg or a Kevin Systrom or a, or a Bill Gates. Uh, but if you actually look at how that's working out, it isn't really the, the picture we see. Uh, and you know, if I think back on my own childhood and then look at some kids we have today, here's an example of Armand, a fifth grader in just north of Harlem in New York City in Washington Heights. And he, he lives in a neighborhood that's a low-income neighborhood. None of the schools in his neighborhood are teaching computer science. None of the kids near him can run into the same opportunity that, that you know, I was lucky that my dad gave me when I was growing up. And there's a question of, will he end up having at all a chance of becoming effectively the next Mark Zuckerberg? Or this here is Rahel. She uh, lives in Highline, just south of Seattle, about two miles away from where I live. And again, in, in the Highline School District, it's a low-income school district. Again, will the kids in this district without access to computer science ever have a chance of participating in this new digital world and the new American dream? So, you know, when you think about these kids, the question I ask is, what does a career look like for a student graduating in 2030? If a student enters kindergarten today and goes through 13 years of school and four years of college, by 2030, what are the jobs that are going to be available? I used to tell people that unless you plan on getting a job driving a truck or flipping burgers, pretty much anything else you want to do is going to get changed by computers and every industry is getting impacted. Uh, it now turns out there's robots that are being designed that know how to flip burgers, and there's trucks that know how to drive themselves. And this is already happening today. So by, by 2030, pretty much any job we think about preparing our kids for, any career, any industry we think of, is getting overturned by technology. It's not just about the tech industry. Now, since I, I wear a hat with the name Code on it, and I represent Code.org, 
people assume that my message is that our kids should be learning to code. Uh, and of course, I think many people agree that our kids should be learning to code, but my message is actually very different than that, and it's a nuanced difference. My message is that our schools should be teaching computer science. And there's two important differences there. One is that this should be taught in schools, because if kids like me learn how to code when their dad brings them home a computer, it'll only be accessible to the kids who have dads who are gonna bring them home a computer. Uh, and then the second reason, the second difference is that coding is a somewhat narrow field. This isn't about just teaching kids JavaScript or HTML, it's about teaching them how the internet works, how encryption works, and the breadth of how computers and technology are changing society and changing industry. Now there's this misconception that computer science education is on the rise, and in fact, when I started looking at this, I had the same misconception. You know, the tech industry is booming, you see Google and Facebook and Instagram and YouTube and all these things growing, so of course computer science education has also been booming. Uh, it actually turns out computer science education has only recently started recovering after 10 years of going in the exact opposite direction that what everybody would expect. Uh, this is a chart of computer science graduates over the last 15 years. We're still not as where we were in 2003, uh, so it, it's been declining and only recently increasing, and the number of women in the field is still one half of what it was about 10 years ago. So this is, we have a lot of work to do literally just to catch up to where we were 10 years ago and let alone to, to make it forward to the next level of where, where this country can be. Now people assume since I come from the tech industry and I don't actually live in California, but uh, people assume I live in California, people assume the tech industry is desperately trying to hire computer programmers in California and that's why we should be teaching people computer science. The reality is every single industry is desperately trying to hire computer programmers everywhere. Uh, now if you look at the picture in California, it's a pretty interesting picture. Uh, in California right now today, there's 87,000 currently open jobs in, in computing and computer science and for computer science graduates. If you do the math, this adds up to about $10 billion a year of annual payroll that companies would pay to students, to graduates, if they knew how to have these skills. $10 billion a year for students that don't have a chance to do that yet. Now, if you look at California's universities, just last year, 3,500 CS graduates graduated from California universities. So these are the students that have a chance to enter these 87,000 jobs. That's how many students our universities are putting out. Uh, if you look at what happens in high school, the AP computer science class in high school had less than 9,000 high school students take that exam. And this is an exam that has been growing in popularity, but it's still nowhere near the level of opportunity that there is in terms of the jobs. And in that exam, only 26% were female. Uh, only less than 1,000 of those kids were Hispanic Americans less than 150 were black. So if you consider the number of Hispanic kids or African American kids vying for those jobs, I mean, those 1,150 kids are gonna have a great career, uh, but all the other underprivileged kids, all the other black or Hispanic kids in this entire state just don't even have the pathway to get to these amazing jobs. And now you may think this picture is just in California because of course Silicon Valley is where all these jobs are, this actually is the same picture in every single state in this country. The numbers are smaller, but the picture is just as lopsided or even worse in many states. Uh, if you look nationwide, there's the predictions from the national government is that there are gonna be over one million computing jobs in, within 10 years in every single industry and in every single state that are open and, and basically unfilled because our schools aren't graduating enough students in this field. Uh, this is also a ridiculous graph. This basically compares the lifetime earnings or the value of a high school education versus a college education versus a college degree in computer science. The step up from a college degree to a computer science college degree is almost as big as the step up from a high school degree to a computer science degree. Now that's not gonna last forever. The reason that's happening is because not enough kids are going into this field. And the reason not enough kids are going into this field is because of what happens in high school and K through 12. So, now every time I talk about this, people say, oh yes, we know about the STEM problem. You know, you're talking about the STEM problem, we need more kids in STEM. Uh, and you know, my message is that the STEM problem is in computer science. Uh, and I don't mean to demean the rest of STEM. If you look at the totality of job availabilities in STEM, 71% of all new jobs in STEM are in computing fields. 
for computer programmers, data analysis, cybersecurity experts, systems engineers, et cetera. If you look at, computer, if you look at graduates from universities, only 8% of all the STEM graduates in our universities are graduating in computer science. There's a huge mismatch in what, are, what we're doing within STEM. We're, we're putting a lot of kids through STEM fields, but the STEM fields they're studying in university are actually not the STEM fields that the jobs are in and where the growth for this country is and where the opportunity is. Now, uh, of course, computer science is about technology, and what we learn in computer science class is all about technology, but as teachers, we don't want to just lead kids down a vocational path of here's this high paying job, go through school, get this job, every kid has to become a software engineer. Uh, but that's not what it's all about. Computer science is just as much about logic, problem solving, and creativity. Uh, and there's lots of ways you can give examples of this, but my favorite way of talking about this is just with two pictures. Uh, this is the picture of the first computer technology ever. It's the first computer from 1943. And back then, if you wanted to study technology, you'd be learning about you know, these very large devices and vacuum tubes and things like that. Uh, and the technology of then is completely irrelevant today. And if you were studying that technology then, it wouldn't actually be relevant today. Uh, this picture, by comparison, is a picture of the first computer programmer, Ada Lovelace, who wrote the first computer program 100 years before the first computer was actually created. Uh, and that's astonishing in multiple ways. First of all, most people don't know that the first computer programmer was a woman, so hats off to women. Uh, and secondly, that shows that computer programming and computer science is more than about technology. What she was doing was solving theoretical problems, designing algorithms for a theoretical machine that didn't even exist, but talking about if you could give a machine instructions, here's what an algorithm would look like. And you know, as a mathematician, an applied mathematician, she was exercising the same type of critical thinking skills and logic and problem solving skills that we want students to learn no matter what field they go into. Uh, so you know, while computer science is fantastically vocational, it leads to the absolutely best paying jobs in the country, it's just as much foundational. You know, when I went to school and when pretty much every student, everybody in this room went to school and every student today goes to school, every school teaches kids about the digestive system. If I ask people to raise their hands, how many of you know what that is and did you learn about it in school? Everybody would raise their hands. Or if you said, how many of you learned about the basics of how electricity works, how a battery has you know, high voltage and low voltage and the circuit goes through and the light bulb lights up, Every one of us has learned that in school. Uh, every one of us has learned about the Pythagorean theorem in school. You know, A squared plus B squared is C squared. Most of us aren't using that in our day-to-day -day lives, but it's something we learned, we memorized, and we had to do it in math class because this is what, a, what we consider foundational education. You know, we're now in the 21st century. It's equally foundational for every single kid to understand what an algorithm is or how the internet works. You know, today's top headlines include this battle between Apple and the FBI about encryption, where Apple is saying we can't make an encryption backdoor just for the FBI without breaking all of our encryption, and the FBI is saying, yes, you can, and most Americans have no idea who's experts to believe. And part of this is a philosophical or political battle, but part of it is a technical battle where literally Americans are like, well, we don't, we don't even really know what encryption means, so who knows who, who you can believe. You know, these are the types of things that school can give you a better understanding of. Now, computer science may also even help students in other fields. This is early research, so it's not at a point where one can make causal statements, but there's extremely strong correlation between teaching computer science and improvements of math scores. Uh, what this chart shows you is, you know, the College Board looked at students that were in the same level of math when they took the SAT or the PSAT. So these kids in 10th grade or 9th grade were equal as math students. And then some of them took the AP computer science exam and some of them didn't. And then if you looked at the subsequent year, how do they do at calculus or at statistics, the students with computer science backgrounds in between all showed an increase in their math scores. Now, does that mean the computer science helped the math or something else we don't know? But at least there's a strong correlation. And anybody who's studied this field knows in their heart that computer science helps you develop your logic skills and your analytical thinking skills as well. So this issue really begins in K through 12. Whether you care about the foundational learning that every kid must have or the vocational pathway to the best paying jobs in the country, K 
K through 12 is where we can, is the only place we can solve this problem. Uh, surveys now have shown that nine out of 10 parents want their child to study computer science. So that's not just, you know, white parents or wealthy parents or parents who get technology. You know, I, when I first started talking about this stuff, people would tell me that there's neighborhoods where those parents don't even know about technology and they don't think their kids can have a future. They don't see their kids going into college or anything. It turns out nine out of 10 parents want schools to teach computer science. They get that this is where the world is going. Uh, they get that technology is changing faster than they can keep up. And the idea that their school isn't even trying to prepare their kids for what's gonna happen in 15 years feels broken to all of the parents in this country. Uh, meanwhile, only one fourth of our schools have even a single course in computer science. So if you're one of the parents in the other 75% of school districts or schools in this country, you may be sending your kid to a public education that will teach them the same things that you learned when you went to school, but not the one thing that leads to the best paying jobs in the country and that is completely changing every industry in every single region. The gender gap in technology also starts in K-12. All of us have read about how Google is 90% male or Twitter is all white and so on. Uh, and if you look at it, the, these tech companies and tech jobs are predominantly male, they're predominantly white, and that's not just a problem at the software workforce, it's a problem that, that happens at the university level where the majority of university students are white and Asian males in computer science. And then if you look back at high school, the same thing is true there as well. In fact, studies have shown that a high school girl who tries computer science is six times more likely to major in it. Uh, I'm sorry, 10 times more likely to major in it. Uh, any student who tries computer science in high school is six times more likely to major in it, but especially so if they're female. Uh, now, the other thing to consider is when, when the majority of our schools, when, when three-fourths of schools don't even teach this field, if you look at that little high school box, this is really what it looks like because three-quarters of those kids don't even have access in high school, which means if they go to college, that's really what the college, the university box looks like, and this is really what the software workforce looks like when 75% of our kids are just simply being left behind without having the access. So if the majority of kids taking this in university are doing it because they learned it in high school, that's what the picture looks like. And in fact, if you look at what's happening in America's universities today, the best universities, Harvard, Stanford, Princeton, Yale, the number one course in all of these universities is computer science because the students at those universities when they were in high school had exposure to this field. Computer science literally just passed in Harvard EC10, the introductory economics class is the number one field and, it, and Stanford has been the most popular major for years. Whereas if you look at lower schools, community colleges, schools where many of your students may end up, those schools don't see computer science growing the same way because those kids didn't have the exposure when they were in high school. The other thing that has really changed very recently is at this point, the education system actually agrees. Among K through 12 teachers, more than half believe not only that computer science should be taught, but that should be required for every single student to learn. And that's a fascinating change. This is definitely not how people felt two, three years ago. In fact, the only people that aren't fully caught up to this, because the kids are, the parents are, and the teachers are, the only group that isn't fully aware of this is the school administrators, not because they are against computer science. <laughs> Thank you. I'd like to apologize to the school administrators in this room. Uh, <laughs> The issue actually isn't that the school administrators are clueless. They also know that this is important. They just don't realize that everybody else wants it too. Uh, so they don't realize that their teaching staff is on board and the parents want it as well. They, if you ask them, is it important? They say, of course it's important, but you know, we have lots of things to do. Um, and then lastly, just six weeks ago, the president of the United States said something incredible. He said, in the new economy, computer science is no longer an optional skill. It's a basic skill right alongside reading, writing, and arithmetic. Uh, and And I have to share, by the way, it's a pretty special moment for me when I, I actually got a chance to read that speech before it was given uh, a couple days before and just looking at it and saying like, this is actually gonna be said uh, after having spent two and a half years of my life repeating this message, it's a pretty neat moment. Uh, but you also know that if the president is saying that, it's not because he just thinks so, it's because he's ran polls and done studies and knows that by, the, by this moment saying this, it's not gonna be this like groundbreaking message that nobody's thought of it's basically staying what the electorate already believes, 
and is showing America that this is where we are now. Uh, so, you know, there's all these reasons to teach this foundational and vocational field. Uh, the real question is, can the public K through 12 education system evolve? Uh, and, you know, when I started Code.org, uh, initially I thought, you know, we should run a, create a network of after school clubs because you can't change school systems. And people would tell me, don't even bother trying to change school. Uh, and then, you know, I realized that if we don't change real school, we won't get to all kids, to the real kids that need this the most. Uh, and, you know, when you think about the school system, most people don't think about this sort of agile, innovative, high-tech kind of thing. That's not the picture people have in mind when they think of America's schools. Uh, but, but when you think of America's school teachers, those are actually people who can make change happen. And in fact, we, we have made change happen. You know, if you think about some, a course like math, math used to be taught using an abacus. Today, every single math teacher is teaching math using a device that looks like that. You know, that device didn't exist 70 years ago. It's only been around for about 40 years. Every single student in this country has to buy one of these devices. Computers are almost as cheap as these devices today. Uh, and in fact, you know, I wonder, if we teach all these kids how to use that calculator, what job will that lead them to? There's only one job in this country that requires knowing how to use that device, which is math teacher. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and obviously we need lots and lots of math teachers, but maybe we could change math class to use some new device or some new methodologies that will also apply to other courses and other fields as well. Uh, and this is definitely possible. We've already done it in the last 40 years once in math. We could do it again. There's another question that we need to answer, which is, can we change stereotypes? Uh, this is a picture of a woman in Silicon Valley who held up a photo just saying, I help build software. I look like an engineer. And a whole bunch of software engineers posted similar pictures on Twitter and Facebook saying, I'm also an engineer. Now, this was a great campaign. The problem is roughly 20% of the women in, uh, sorry, roughly 20% of our tech workforce are women. So even though the women who are in the tech workforce are saying, I exist, if you're a software engineer going to work and there's like eight guys and one girl, that picture doesn't mean a lot to you. Uh, it's hard to change stereotypes when the facts on the ground actually say something else. So you can point out the few women there are in tech, but when the facts on the ground are so lopsided, the stereotype persists. So my question has been, can we, can we evolve the public education system and can we break a stereotype by changing the facts on the ground? The first step in doing this has been for us the hour of code, uh, which, let me just ask, how, I have a quick question. How many people here have heard of the hour of code? All right, can you hold up your hand still because I want to get a picture of that? Hold up your hands. All right, thank you. Um, the Hour of Code, as you've obviously heard about it, is this now grassroots movement that now has over 200,000 educators behind it. You know, it's the coolest thing ever to have thought of this idea about two and a half years ago. And when we thought of it, Code.org was like a four-person team. And we thought, you know, this is a big way we can get this exciting. Let's get every teacher to do it. Uh, and uh, the first question the rest of my team asked is like, what army is gonna do that? Uh, and this was about five months before the first hour of code. Uh, most teachers in schools don't even realize that this is something that has only existed for two and a half years. Uh, we just finished our third hour of code. Uh, I wanted to play a short video for those of you who haven't seen it, and this video came out uh, about seven months ago as, as the lead up to the, the most recent hour of code. Your teacher says you guys are into it. We are. It's very awesome. Code.org has partnered with 30 public school districts across the country, including New York, Chicago, and Denver, to provide lessons in teacher training and writing. The largest education events in history. Organizers have set what they called an ambitious goal of reaching 10 million students this week. Almost 15 million signed up. This week, I'm proud to join the students, teachers, businesses, and nonprofit organizations taking new steps to support computer science in America's schools. Hey, 
I ran an hour of code that's easy to do. I got it. They've been so excited about it. Oh my gosh, it's working. I did it right. They don't even have to be a computer science engineer. Maybe they want to do something else. But in our world, this is going to be the basis for everything that we do. Move. Semicolon. When you're building a program, you have to think outside of the box. If you can change technology, you can change the world. I challenge girls in every single country to learn one hour of code. Every district should do, every district can do it. Please help us get the hour of code to every school and every classroom and every child. And my school's doing it. So we set out the goal of reaching 200 million students, uh, and I wanted to share some of the feedback, because so many of you have hosted an Hour of Code in your classroom. I wanted to share and celebrate some of the feedback from the actual students uh, who participated in this and, and tried coding for the first time. Uh, this is from a middle school student in Idaho saying, I loved it purely and wholly. It was fun to do. I want to just do that over and over again, because I really enjoyed what I could do with it. I enjoyed its interactivity and how it felt to control what happened. It felt really satisfying to me. I wish we could do it every day, uh, which is <laughs> awesome. Um, but also, when, you, when I read that, I, it both, first of all, makes me feel good about what we're bringing to students. It also makes me wonder, how can we make kids feel like that about everything they're doing in school? Uh, so this from Austin Town in Ohio is a teacher saying the highlight of the week for me was seeing the pride and excitement on the faces of my first graders when they successfully created animations and drawings by actually writing lines of code. Never in my wildest dreams did I think I would be teaching coding to first graders. Uh, and you know, there's a, over 100,000 teachers like this one that had the exact same experience of realizing that this is something they can do in their classroom with their kids. Uh, in Panama City in Florida, this student said, silly to say it, but doing code is the funnest thing I've ever done. Uh, we're hoping he or she also does some grammar. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And then um, in Brooklyn, a teacher is saying our students have asked to have one hour every week, uh, which is really what the hour of code is about. It's not about just doing one hour. It's about where it goes beyond that. And my favorite, as I was looking through these things, I was, I was actually preparing them for my, for my staff first to show just the awesome words and things we get from around the world. So I figured, let me find one internationally. And I clicked on our map. And the very first international thing I found was this in Namibia. Uh, so somebody saying, our event will not only be part of the global hour of code, but it's an extended feasibility study to put these materials incorporated into the Namibian national curriculum, uh, which, which is awesome. <laughs> uh, and, and this actually makes a really important point, which is the hour of code started as an idea in Seattle and spread to almost every school in the United States. But what we do in the United States in technology, we lead the world. We may not lead the world in education, we may not lead the world in physics or math, but this is a country that invented the computer, it invented the internet, it invented the smartphone, it invented social media, it invented e-commerce. We're also, when we do this, the rest of the world is following us and is why the Hour of Code has become such a national phenomenon. And in fact, there's now seven countries, not just Namibia, but Italy, Argentina, Saudi Arabia, the UK, Australia, South Korea, have all announced national curriculum rollout plans uh, before the president made his computer science for all speech. So this is, a, this is thanks to your leadership that this has happened. And the last time I made these slides, the Hour of Code had reached 200 million students. Uh, that's actually slide of, out, slightly out of date. We're now at 230 million. Uh, it grows by about one or two million every single week, which is incredible. More importantly, almost half of the students participating in the Hour of Code are girls. And so when I spoke about changing the facts on the ground, the reality is now that computer science in America's schools, especially when you go to the lower grades, which is where most people have done the Hour of Code, is 50-50. 
Today's fourth graders, if they've done the Hour of Code, they did it in a classroom with equal number of boys and girls, they don't have any stereotype about who's better or worse among the genders. And this is how, the way we break this gender gap is in the K through 12 school system. Uh, we had more girls try computer science in just one week than in the entire history of the field of computing, uh, and, uh, which is also awesome kick-ass. So, uh, you know, one thing, by the way, people ask me, how did this get so big? Uh, and what people think is because the president talked about the hour of code or because we got celebrities to tweet about it or, or things like that, and those things helped, and the, getting to be on the homepage of Apple or Google also helped. But, but as a tech company, Code.org actually has analytics. We measure where things come from and how things spread. And by far, not just by like a little bit, but by far the largest reason the hour of code has spread can anybody guess? It's because of teachers. Thank you. Yes, because of you. So uh, thank you very much for, for your help in getting us here. Uh, now, I get a lot of criticism about, you know, what can you learn in one hour? And I should uh, be very clear that the goal of our, the Hour of Code is not to teach people to become computer scientists. The goal of the Hour of Code is to realize that coding can be fun. Uh, and we, of course, as you probably know, have tutorials featuring some of the coolest brands that kids like to play with. Uh, so first, just learning that this is fun, unlike many other things you do in school, is a big deal. Uh, the other thing for teachers and students to learn is that you know, the pictures you see of code start with like semicolons and angle brackets and so on, but basic coding can start with dragging and dropping and you know, playing, and that's a much easier way to get eased into it, and, and you don't need to worry about whether you mistype the semicolon. And then much more importantly, it's a creative act. When your students make something that looks like this, it's actually something they want to show home to their mom or dad, unlike you know, a multiple choice problem set that they, you know, the answer was C or D. Uh, you know, the, and they like to show their grades too, but that's a lot more fun to show. Uh, and in fact, when you're calculating the angles to do something like that, you're learning about angles. You might be learning about the Pythagorean theorem as part of trying to create some art rather than tr you know, just answering a multiple choice question. Uh, one thing I'd like to do right now is to actually give a quick demo. Uh, how many people here have, by the way, already done the Hour of Code? I'm guessing it's a lot, yes. How many of you have seen our Star Wars tutorial? All right, so less than half the room did that, so I'm gonna quickly go into our Star Wars tutorial, but then I'm gonna show some stuff that you probably haven't seen. Uh, and this may not work, because uh, I'm on the Wi-Fi for the conference, which has been spotty. Uh, but I tested it before you were all in this room, and it worked back then. So we'll give it a shot. All right, so this is our Star Wars tutorial. I'm gonna pause the video. So as you know, for many of our tutorials, there's instructions helping you get the, uh, you know, telling you what to do. So we're gonna try to get BB-8, the little droid, to get the scrap metal. So here's little BB-8, and he's trying to get there. And he has one command telling him to move right. Can anybody tell me what else he needs to do? He needs to move right again. And I'm gonna hit run. Um, and for a student who's done that, that's basically the very first experience in coding, and we tell him you wrote two lines of code. Uh, and you know, this, these type of puzzles aren't very, very hard, but I wanna show you if you haven't seen it, uh, this tutorial lets you do something very different than most of the rest of the code.org tutorials or hour of code tutorials that you can see. So here BB-8 wants to move right and move down, but you can click this button, you know, I can put some of the move right commands, but then you can click to show text, and then the commands you type actually just change to JavaScript, and then you can actually type the commands. So for kids or teachers who want to learn sort of how real coding is done by the professionals, you could do this, this way, and in fact you can s switch back and forth between blocks and text seamlessly. Uh, and in fact you can drag blocks into here. So whether you're dragging or dropping or typing, you can write code that way, which is really cool. <laughs> um, and then if you haven't seen some of our tutorials that let you build games, you can get interactivity in these things. It's not just about solving puzzles. 
So in this level, you need to teach R2-D2 how to react to the keys on the keyboard. So it says, what should R2-D2 do when you hit an up arrow? I'm gonna tell him to go down when you hit an up arrow. And when I hit the down arrow, I'm gonna have him go up because I'm messing around. And when I hit the left arrow, I'm gonna go right. And when I hit the right arrow, he's gonna go left. And now he gets, needs to get all these rebel pilots so to go up. Oops, okay, that's up. That's down. This is so much harder than it looks, by the way. <laughs> so once you learn very basic interactivity, you can start building your own game. Uh, and this very short 15-step tutorial, if you haven't done it with your kids, it, you know, it starts with this, the same when up, when down, when left, when right, just those keys to get R2-D2 to move. But then you can do other things, saying when the game starts, let's set the background to being a, you know, the Hoth ice planet, and we'll set the droid to R2-D2 and give him a super fast speed. Uh, and then you can say, let's put some characters on the screen. So I'm gonna add a stormtrooper. For those of you who aren't Star Wars fans, that's a bad guy. <laughs> and in fact, I'm gonna put two stormtroopers on here. Um, and so now really the question is what should happen if R2-D2 runs into a stormtrooper? So you can say when you, when you run into a stormtrooper, then you can say, for example, when you get a stormtrooper, let's first play a sound. Oops. Because these Star Wars sounds are really cool. And so we're gonna play a random R2-D2 sound. And then of course we need to get points. This is probably my favorite thing to see kids do because there's choices and you can have R2-D2 get points and kids almost always like to get a thousand points. <laughs> but then one, one thing we could do to make this much more interesting is every time we get a stormtrooper, we can add more stormtroopers. And this is a nice way of teaching really basic math like exponents. So every time we get one stormtrooper, we're gonna put two stormtroopers added onto the field. So every time R2-D2, he's got super fast skills, he's, he's set to super fast speed. Every time he gets a stormtrooper, he's gonna get a thousand points, but then two more stormtroopers will appear. So now we can try this game. And he's moving super fast. And new stormtroopers are showing up. R2-D2 has almost 40,000 points by now, which is really important. So this can go quite a bit until the computer crashes. Uh, but what's exciting about that What's most exciting about this is after you've done this is you can hit finish and then share this somewhere or you can even send the game to your phone and then you can type a phone number and just for those of you who haven't already done this, this is that same game now running on my phone uh, and you probably can't see the phone but you can hear the sounds I think through my speaker. Yay. <laughs> so the ability to get a game that you just made like that automatically on your phone within five seconds is the magic of what computing teaches you, which is that the power of creating things doesn't need to be limited to super geniuses. It can be done in something like 10 minutes and get things on your phone. And once a kid starts down that path, it's a path they pretty much want to stay on, not just because of the opportunity and not just because of the foundational learning, but just because it's purely fun. Uh, so I, obviously the Hour of Code has been a big success. Uh, my most important message is really about what comes after the hour of code. I think everybody in this room is already believers in the basics of teaching computer science. Every one of you has probably taught multiple hours of computer science for your students and children. Uh, the real question is what more can we do? Uh, you know, first of all, I wanna go back to the kids that I spoke about at the very beginning. Uh, you know, and I kind of did this thing where I told their story, but their story has actually changed. You know, Rahel, her entire school district of Highline has made a partnership with Code.org. Every single high school in her, uh, 
in her school district now actually teaches computer science. And in fact, that's a picture of her in her computer science class. Uh, she wants to become a doctor when she grows up, but she knows that by the time she graduates from med school, everything in technology is gonna be changing all of medicine, so she wants to be a doctor who's up to speed with the changes in medicine. Uh, Armand, who's in fifth grade in, in Washington Heights in New York, uh, actually not only his, his classroom did the hour of code, the teacher then did 20 hours longer using our curriculum and then trained every teacher in her entire elementary school and the surrounding schools were all trained by the same teacher to teach computer science. Uh, he just finished our third course. Uh, when he grows up, he wants to become a Navy SEAL, but if that doesn't work out, he wants to become a computer programmer. <laughs> In the last two and a half years since the Hour of Code started and Code.org started, we've now had over 100 school districts embrace computer science as a district-wide effort, including all of the largest school districts in the country, New York, Los Angeles, Chicago, Miami, Las Vegas, Houston, San Francisco. We just recently announced Oakland, and just a few days ago, we announced the entire Inland Empire region of California. Besides the 200,000 teachers who've done this, 25,000 teachers have been trained to teach CS, and we're now at the rate of training about 30,000 teachers every 12 months, uh, which is an incredible pace of teacher training. Uh, and the majority of these are women, which is a big difference because before we started, 56% of, of computer science teachers were male uh, and white, which then just reinforces a stereotype for their students. Uh, when you look at what most teachers are, most teachers ha happen to be female, and today, I think we can squarely say most computer science teachers have become female as well. Uh, we're already at the point where not only 10% of the students in grades K through eight, but 10% of all students in this country have begun coding, which is not just for one hour, it's for creating accounts on our platform and going well beyond one hour. Uh, and almost the majority of them are girls, which is also a huge accomplishment. Uh, 19 states have changed their graduation policies. Five states have already begun funding computer science. Literally every month we hear about some state that is working with us to do something. Virginia just changed its state standards to require computer science. Idaho, the legislature just passed a funding bill to, for computer science that's going to the governor's desk. The news on this stuff is now happening almost every week. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, seven countries have changed their curriculum. So uh, computer science has now become the fastest spreading course in public education and by far. And in the schools that do offer it, they see record enrollment by students because students want this. Uh, this is a graph of the AP Computer Science course. It shows growth in the AP course, which has been astronomical just in the last three years. But while that chart looks great, there's two really big problems with the chart. Uh, the one problem is because is if you look at the numbers, which you probably can't read, uh, the top of that chart is at 50,000 students. So that's 50,000 students a year taking AP Computer Science. There's over a million students a year taking AP Calculus or Biology or English. We have roughly 16 million students in our high schools. Only 50,000 of them are taking AP Computer Science. The reason that's happening is this chart shows the growth of enrollment in a course that's only offered in 7% of our schools. In the schools that are teaching it, they've seen enrollment more than double in just three years. In the schools that aren't teaching it, enrollment is still at zero, of course, because when you're not teaching it, enrollment stays at zero. So the other nice thing is diversity is actually improving in AP Computer Science, but with 93% of schools not even teaching it, we have a very long way to go. Uh, so, and again, I want to remind you of this picture that the majority of parents want their kids to study computer science and our schools don't teach it. And I want to end with a couple of comments on some specific ways if in your school, whether you're a teacher, whether you're a district administrator or principal, how you can go beyond one hour of code to integrate computer science into your curriculum. Uh, so first of all, the only URL you need to know for this is code.org, and if you visit code.org and click on the Teach button, there's a lot of resources there. Uh, so please, when you get home, do that uh, if you aren't already doing this. If you're an elementary school teacher or if you're a principal in an elementary school or a district administrator, uh, we offer one-day PD workshops free of cost. We've had 25,000 teachers go through these and the majority rate it not only as a good PD, but they actually say it was the best PD they've ever had. Uh, how many people here have actually gone to one of our PD workshops so far? Awesome. Uh, so these, these PD workshops, they're one day only and if you visit the, the website where we said you can find a workshop on the map and just register, not pay anything, you get 
free t-shirts and swag and actually even the classroom supplies for doing the courses. Uh, this is where we have workshops currently planned in California, so if you're near any of those uh, red dots, you can go to one of these workshops uh, and you can see the, the quote from one of the teachers attending one of these workshops saying, if you'd asked me a week ago whether I could or should or would teach computer science in kindergarten, I would have just rolled my eyes, and now I'm thinking I'm gonna introduce it tomorrow and start giving frequent CS lessons. This isn't just about an hour of code, it's about integrating computer science throughout elementary school. Uh, these are the three facilitators that do our, uh, that host our workshops in California, and they actually are hosting a session today at 12.30 in the tapestry room at the Hilton Hotel. So. Uh, Apologies in advance if more people want to go to this than the tapestry room can fit, uh, but they're gonna do a, a short one hour version of our PD to, to introduce you to our computer science fundamentals course for elementary school students. Uh, and I wanna actually quickly ask for a big round of applause for Steve, Kathy, and Liz, who've been fantastic facilitators for us. Now, adding computer science to middle school or high school is not as easy because the right level of dosage isn't just 20 hours, and it's also not just learning the ABCs. The, the third graders, the fifth graders, they're learning much easier stuff, so as teachers, it's also much easier. If you're middle school or high school teachers, adding computer science to the true curriculum means changing the school schedule. You can't, as a teacher, just decide, I'm gonna start doing computer science at 10 o'clock nowadays, you know, forget my English class, we, we now have computer science. Uh, you need the principal to be on board, the master schedule needs to change. So uh, you know, the way to start is if you haven't done an hour of code, introducing it so your school and your teachers, the students get on board, uh, and then getting the administration to, to switch over. But it really requires the school system to change, and that's not an easy thing to do. Uh, now, in California, we've actually worked with the school districts in many of the, the throughout the states to actually get the district at the district level on board so, uh, and in fact, around the country, almost 150 school districts work with us. So this is the list inside California. So if you could please take a second and look and see if you're in any of these school districts, and this is the, there's two pages worth of school districts just in California that we're working with. So I'm gonna wait a little bit longer so you can see if you're on that list, if you're a teacher. And this is the rest of the list, including Nevada and Arizona. So all of the people out there who just clap their hands, I'm assuming you're clapping for your home district, not somebody else's district. If you're in one of these districts, we're currently recruiting teachers who want to say, I'm a math teacher, or I'm a tech ed teacher, or I'm a physics teacher, or an English teacher, or a history teacher, but I wanna go through a year-round program of PD to become a computer science teacher. And that doesn't mean changing your jobs, it means being able to teach at least one section of computer science along the rest of your schedule. And at the district level, the district is already on board with this, and we're now trying to get the teachers recruited to do this. So uh, I'm gonna show once more the, the previous page again, so if you didn't find yourself over there, and then the second page. And David at code.org is, is uh, the guy in charge of this. Uh, he's somewhere in the audience. And the reason I'm putting David's picture up there uh, is basically if you're in a district that's not on this list, your district can reach out to David for all of California and the Southwest. And if you're not in California or the Southwest, you can email, you could probably email David anyway and he can, he can route you to the right person. Uh, but I wanted to thank David for personally managing all of those relationships with those school districts uh, because relationships with school districts and administrations are not easy uh, and we have one guy doing it with two pages worth of districts, uh, which thank you David for your, for your incredibly hard work. Um, So I have just two more slides to show. You know, I started out by showing the picture in California where we have 87,000 currently open jobs and 9,000 high school students just, just took the AP exam last year. Thanks to the teachers that we've been trained, ignoring the hour of code, the hour of code is just the first step. The real step is teaching computer science in school. What we've done in the last two and a half years in just California, there's now 3,000 new computer science teachers across K through 12 and in their classrooms, there's 500,000 new computer science students. Now, most of them are in elementary school, but that's a very different picture. 500,000 students who are now gonna be, hopefully some of them becoming computer science students in high schools, if the teachers in the high school here actually sign up for that, and then hopefully some of them getting degrees, and hopefully some of them getting a chance at entering the best paying jobs in the country. Uh, and again, these numbers are all because of the teachers here who have adopted the Hour of Code, or gone through our PD curriculum, and so on. Uh, 
And again, if you want to participate in that, that's where you do it. Uh, lastly, I just want to say this has been an amazing, amazing ride. Uh, I'm sure for all the teachers who've been part of this, but for me personally, uh, the, the chance of getting to start something that just started out as an idea to then hear that people in Namibia are thinking of adding it to their curriculum. And I've, you know, if you had to ask me where Namibia is, I just would know it's somewhere in Africa, but not exactly where, but they're actually looking at adopting our curriculum, not only in Namibia, but throughout the world to know that there's now been literally 300,000 teachers engaging with our stuff and millions of parents and students. Uh, I just wanted to thank everybody in this room and really all the educators in the world that have basically adopted our vision that every student in every school should have the opportunity to learn computer science. Thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate it.